Well, you said that theories should be useful for practitioners, and I actually wonder about that because it seems to me like theory creates research. That research may give practitioners answers, but a whole lot more theory has to be built and verified, and that process takes a lot longer and requires a lot more researchers to work on than just somebody coming up with a theory and handing it to a manager and saying, here you go. To use an analogy, the driver interacts with about 5% of the car. The car doesn't work unless a whole lot of other people have made sure that all of those components fit together, and those components to me are the theories. In your opinion, you know, uh, who is the user of theory, and what does theory do for that constituent? When I think about theories, and you think about theory for whom, and theory for what. And I think about this stakeholder model mm -hmm. where you think about different recipients or you could also say different beneficiaries of our theories. So you mentioned researchers. So clearly, uh, when we do research, a clear beneficiary of our theories are the researchers because we are helping shape these theories collectively as a field. And every time we report a result, then other researchers can take that to the next, uh, to the next level. But we also have many other beneficiaries uh, of our theories. For example, students. Uh, when we have good theories and we teach good theories, students benefit as opposed to uh, teaching opinion and, oh, I talked to my friend who's a CEO, right. and she told me that this worked at her company, so I'm going to teach that. Uh, we also have practitioners, of course, uh, practicing managers. And as, as we know, managers do not read our top journals. They don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> they read the Wall Street Journal. They read maybe Harvard Business Review, maybe. But they do not read our top journals. So how do we reach out to those practitioners with our theories? And maybe by publishing articles in, in some what we call bridging journals, like Business Horizons, Organizational Dynamics, Sloan Management Review, also through executive education. So that's another stakeholder, the, the practitioners, the executives, the managers. If, I'm gonna make, make a comment about this. If you're a lawyer and you do not know the latest law, you cannot practice law, you just can't be a lawyer. If you're a doctor, right. you don't know <laughs> the latest research in medicine, you just cannot be an effective doctor. But you can be a manager without mm. knowing the latest research in management. So there are many, many managers who are not doing a very good job, and because they don't rely on the scientific evidence, they do not rely on, on our theories. And another uh, stakeholder group that, unfortunately, us, I think, in, man in management, we do not pay enough attention to is policymakers. Mm -hmm. Some of the laws that are created and passed in this country and many other countries are related to employee well-being, are related to employee performance, to the behavior of leaders in organizations, regulations about what to report, what not to report in terms of a company financial performance, and there's a tremendous amount of theories and research in management that is now being translated to those stakeholders. But everything begins with a good theory. And a good theory doesn't mean that I talk about the theory. The theory needs to be empirically proven, or at least validated in some, in some case. I would say proven is very strong because I don't think we can ever prove a theory to be true, but it is like a fence, and Karl Popper had this analogy, the truth is in the center, and our theory is a fence around the truth. And every time we collect more data, the fence gets smaller and smaller and smaller and closer to the truth, which we never get to, but at least with better and better theories and better data, we get closer and closer to that truth. So I want to follow up with saying that there are different stakeholders who are going to use our theory. Shouldn't, should that suggest that maybe we make that very clear in the articles that we write, that, hey, I'm not writing this for the practitioners, I'm actually writing this for the other researchers because we don't have something that's ready for the practitioners yet. Or, hey, this is in fact for students, so it's a little bit more general than what you would expect for a practitioner who works in a particular context, but it's a beginning point. I mean, if we think about, we, we signal our methods. This is the method I use, and here's why, and here's why it's appropriate for the situation. Maybe we should be developing a kind of typology that allows us to make those decisions for theories as well. What do you think? 
That's, that's a good point. And in fact, if, if you look at the mission statements of journals, you have journals that target practitioners, journals that target other researchers. So in a way, that is being done right now. And it is very hard to be what I call a Da Vinci academic, meaning an academic who is writing for everybody within the same article. It is very hard to do. But we do have examples of great researchers in our field who have published in journals. Then they have also published textbooks. They have served as expert witnesses in important legal cases. And also they have uh, appeared in the media and published in bridging journals. So that is not impossible to do. It is hard, but I think it's something for us to aspire to, to be in a way the Vinci academic, <laughs> but not everything in the same article in the same outlet.